hard work on the topic, and this is the position he's reached. So he says there, a biological model of consciousness incorporating sensation, memory, fantasy, quote, tendencies, decisions, strengths and weaknesses, unquote, free will and moral responsibility is not self-contradictory. As an informational state, the conscious mind could be duplicated in a suitable artificial medium so that machine consciousness is not just logically possible, but it's entirely feasible. And this is a very important point. He wants to get rid of the magical element, the supernatural element of this insubstantial mind floating around in the brain, poking its little ghostly fingers into the um, squishy stuff of the brain to work out what's going on. He wants to get away from Descartes' idea of this ghostly soul inside, somewhere inside the head that we can never actually see um, tugging on nerves. Now you have to be careful though. There's an important principle here. Always be careful about mocking your enemies. They're probably not quite so dumb after all. And I always remember what Napoleon said. He said, quote, never un interrupt your enemy while he's making a mistake. Now the corollary of that is never mistake your enemy while you're interrupting him. So let's try to define Danette's enemy in a little bit more detail. On slide 18, I've listed, uh, sorry, I've put a um, uh, table which shows the property of mind and then the, on, on the left hand side and the column on the right hand side shows you the dualist approach. Now the properties, there's um, seven properties there. So the first property is the nature of mind and in dualism, classic Descartes or Cartesian dualism, the property of the mind simply is supernatural. Right? It's location, well we can't locate it, you cannot open up the head and say, oh there goes the mind, I just saw it flitting around behind the corpus callosum. Uh, and you, its extension in terms of its uh, physical dimensions, no there are no dimensions, it's ghostly. Do, does it have any internal mechanisms that we understand? No. Can we define the nature of the connection between mind and body? Well, certainly not. Now, is there causative interaction between the spirit or soul and the brain? Absolutely. That's the whole point of this model, is that the soul tells the brain what to do. It draws information from the brain, makes a decision, and sends that information back, somehow directing the brain into what to do. And the final property of mind, of course, is immortality. Well, in supernatural dualism, the mind is all immortal. Now let's look uh, at Dennett's model and compare it with these properties of dualism. So slide 19, you've got the same um, properties there for dualism, but I've now added Dennett's functionalism. So the nature is biological. Location, no, you can't locate it. it can it uh, be measured? No, definitely not. Does Dennett say anything about the internal mechanisms? Does he say anything about the internal or virtual cogs and pulleys of the um, virtual machine in the head? No, he doesn't. Does he say anything about the nature of the connection between his virtual machine and the physical brain? No, he's not a neurologist, so I don't think he would say much about that. Uh, is Donet's virtual machine causally effective in the, in the human behavior? Most certainly. And is it immortal? No. Now, on this point, um, it really doesn't matter because the destination of the spirit uh, really doesn't tell us anything about its present function. So that last one, the seventh property, is quite irrelevant to my case. Now, um, Dennett's supporters may not be very happy with this approach, so I'm just going to modify it slightly to give them another chance on slide 20. So turning to slide 20, the nature of the functionalist model is virtual, right? Location? No, we can't locate it. That's what virtual means. An extension? No, you can't measure it in any way. Again, that's what virtual means. What is its mechanism of action? Well, he keeps saying biological, right? And he says that over and over again, and this is a very important point. No further information on the nature of the connection, nothing further on, uh, sorry, it's causally effective, 
and immortality, well, we're going to miss that one out anyway because it's of no significance. Now we come to the definition of dualism, and this comes from Watson in 1995. Quote, the crux of dualism is an apparently unbridgeable gap between two incommensurable orders of being that must be reconciled if we wish to justify our assumption that there is a comprehensible universe. I think that is a brilliant, brilliant quote. I really, really like that. He's put his finger right on the point. An apparently unbridgeable gap between two incommensurable orders of being. There's two aspects of being, and at first glance they look so profoundly different that we don't even think we can reconcile them. But if we want to make sense of the universe, then we have to reconcile those things. So let's go and look at what biological means. On slide 22, you've got uh, a very pretty model of the reactions involved in photosynthesis. And you can see here the enormous detail in which we, with which we now understand photosynthesis. You can see the physical structure, how every uh, part of that, all the molecules are actually touching each other, they're joined together, and energy is, there's an, on the left hand side of the slide you can see light impinging on the, uh, the elements of the chloroplast, that's the um, inclusion body in the cell which contains the chlorophyll, and how the energy itself tracks through and is handed from one physical point to the next, right through that reaction, and out of that comes the sugar molecule. What else is biological? Well, here's a classic one on say, slide 23. This is the TCA, or citric acid cycle. And again, you've got this precisely delineated input of molecules of energy and how everything touches. So energy is transformed and goes around this cycle uh, and in, we, can, we can understand it at every point. Nothing comes in, springs into existence, uh, nothing vanishes out of existence, it doesn't blink out of existence, and the output at the end is exactly measurable in terms of the inputs. Next one um, it's just the same sort of um, model on slide 24. Um, the very, very precisely uh, delineated functions of creation of, uh, sorry, transfers of energy in the mitochondrium, which is the energy powerhouse of the cell. Again, you can see the uh, lipoprotein cell wall, the, the way the um, proteins are lined up and the inclusion bodies bridging the um, cell wall, sorry, the mitochondrial wall so, uh, from the cytosol into the internal milieu of the mitochondrion. So again, we understand down underneath there you've got ge nuclear gene mutations. If there's a slightest mutation in any one of these um, complexes, sorry, mitochondrial complexes that are modeled there, then down under the bottom line you've got the phenotype uh, of each type of um, disorder that those the specific gene mutations will produce. So again, this is what biology means. You see the model of biology is the reductionist um, model of biology. So epilepsy can be reduced to a specific defect in the wall of the mitochondrion in this model. Now, we go back to what Danette is saying about uh, mental concepts. And you have to ask yourself, when he says that this is biological, what exactly is he saying? Given those examples of biology that I've just shown you in the preceding three slides, I think it is fair enough to say that mental concepts are not biological in any meaningful sense of the term. They are not of the same order of nature. Right? So we've got the physical realm, as in those three preceding slides, and you've got mental concepts. And I've got a few mental concepts at the bottom of this slide. So the first one is copyright law. Now, how can we translate copyright law into the type of model that's shown before? What about comparative theology? How can you make um, the concept of God, or the concept of goodness, or the concept of immortality um, into something which is biological, so that you can see the transfers of matter and energy through the principles of comparative theology. 
I claim 